All right, so let's go and get into today. Uh, chapter four, um, again, focuses primarily on chemical bonding, uh, but there is some other stuff to consider in here as well. So, well, the first things that we want to look at is the idea of, of nomenclature. That is, how do we name substances? How do we name chemical compounds? And if you look at that nomenclature review that I've posted on Blackboard, the one that's the bonus assignment for grade scope, um, what you will find is that no, nomenclature, naming compounds, really falls into three categories. Three categories are salts salts or ionic compounds we can always identify as having a metal or a non-metal or um, more generally speaking a positive ion and a negative ion so that's category one salts and they have and, and naming salts has a structure you name the cation then you name the anion the second one is covalent compounds molecular compounds and those are um, uh, for our purposes here, at least, um, those are binary compounds, that is compounds where we have two different elements, and they have a nomenclature system as well. The nomenclature system focuses primarily on uh, the number and type of each element in the compound. So uh, to, to talk about number, we get into looking at um, prefixes, di, tri, tetra, penta, nona, deca, whatever the case may be. Um, and then the name of the second element in that compound always gets changed to IDE. So if the last element in the compound is carbon, it goes from carbon to carbide. Bromine becomes bromide. Uh, fluorine becomes fluoride. Now, the way that we can recognize these compounds more often than not is A, they're binary, there are only two elements, and B, the two elements that we're talking about that are in question here are pretty much always nonmetals. And then the third type, the third type of compound is the acid. And acids are kind of a funny bunch because what we have in acids are kind of a combination of ionic compounds and molecular compounds. They are ionic in the sense that when we put them into water, they will split into ions, some better than others. Um, but covalent in the sense that for the most part, most of the, the elements in acids are non-metallic. How do I tell them apart? Well, the way to do it is you're looking for something that has hydrogen as the cation. So it looks ionic. It looks like a ion plus uh, an ion, uh, metal and non-metal. Only the metal this time is hydrogen instead of potassium or, or uh, sodium or iron or something like that. And so these three all would fall into that first group. These are all ionic compounds. And the way that we can tell is if I'm looking for substances that have metals in them, the metal is the dead giveaway that we are dealing with an ionic compound. Very few covalent compounds um, have metals in them. Very few acids have metals in them. So, the practice of, of uh, naming a ionic compound is simple. We take those ideas of what we saw in naming ions. So the name of potassium would have been potassium ion. Um, bromine would have been bromide ion. Uh, and basically, we cut off the ion part, and then we put together the two names. So the name of this compound is potassium bromide. Uh, and we can follow a similar process for 
for the rest of these. We had sodium ion for sodium, um, non-metallic ions all end in IDE, so sulfur becomes sulfide ion. Put those together and we get sodium sulfide. And then the same thing here, iron three sulfide, or excuse me, iron two sulfide, we had the iron two ion and the sulfide ion. That's how we came up with this um, pairing to get iron two sulfide. What do those ions look like? Well, this is where we have to, again, know what these numbers mean. So the two here in iron two refers to its charge. So I have Fe positive two. And I have sulfide S minus two. Now, making formulas out of ionic compounds, also not a terribly difficult task. You just have to know what you're doing. The simple rule of thumb is this. If the charges match, then it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So since the charges match here, this is really just FeS. Now, if the charges did not match, what we would do is we'd have to do something called crossing. Um, the charge here moves over here. The charge here moves over here as the subscript. And then we reduce any uh, fractions, um, any common multiples. So if we had done that here, it would have been okay. We would have had Fe2, S2. But we should have recognized, hey, wait a second, those are the same numbers. I need to reduce that ratio. And so the ratio becomes one to one. Iron sulfide is FES. So, in a different kind of problem here, now we have uh, compounds that we need to determine their names. Now, the, again, the, the way to do this, the, the easiest way is, is, is recognition. We need to try to recognize what kind of compound that we're looking at, what kind of substance. So, I can look at this and go, okay, calcium, carbon, oxygen. Okay, calcium's a metal, carbon and oxygen are non-metals good chance that this is an ionic compound. If it's an ionic compound, then I need to separate the cation and the anion, so the metal and the non-metal part. And so the metal part was calcium. The non-metal part, CO3, that's on your polyatomic ion list. That's just something that you're gonna have to know. This is the carbonate ion. So put those together and we have calcium carbonate. In a similar way, I can look at this second one. I've got magnesium, I've got chlorine and oxygen. Another pretty good tip off is I've got parentheses and a subscript here. We don't see that kind of nomenclature in uh, covalent compounds. So we should be able to look at this and go, okay, that's ionic in some kind of way. So once again, I split my metal and my non-metal. The metal's name is magnesium. The ion, the polyatomic ion here, anion, is the perchlorate ion. So this is magnesium perchlorate. In the third one here, I've got nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen is a non-metal, oxygen is a non-metal. So since I have no metallic species here, highly unlikely that it's an ionic compound. 
since there's no hydrogen, can't be an acid. The only thing that this could be is a covalent compound. For covalent compounds, we name and prefix the first element. Now, if the first element has only one atom, then we don't give it a prefix. We just call it what it is. N is nitrogen. The second atom is oxygen. There are two oxygens, so the prefix di gets applied. And we also change the ending of oxygen to IDE, uh, and that's because that's what's done for every covalent compound. So we put that together, we had N1, so nitrogen, O2, dioxide, nitrogen dioxide is the name of this compound. Now the last one here, um, this is what looks to be an ionic compound. I've got uh, a chromium, I've got some oxygens, I've got hydrogens. This looks to be ionic in some kind of way. Now the giveaway here is that it is ionic, but our cation here isn't the chromium actually, it is the hydrogen. Uh, and the way that we can tell that is that usually speaking, the cation will be the first thing in every ionic compound. When we have an ionic compound, or at least something that looks ionic, but has hydrogen as the first element, that is a dead giveaway that we're talking about an acid. As an acid, we would look at this and say, okay, I've got an acid here, uh, and so I need to follow um, you know, one of three sets of rules. Um, if it's a binary acid, which means that it's hydrogen in one other compound, there's a set of naming rules for that. It, those are called the hydroacids. Um, this one isn't one of those kinds. Uh, we can see here quite clearly that we have three different elements. We have hydrogen, we have chromium, and we have oxygen. Uh, so this is what is called a ternary acid or a mineral acid. Um, a, um, actually no, mineral acids are binary. Um, uh, so here we have a ternary acid. This is a more complex acid. It's a polyatomic acid. It's hydrogen with a polyatomic ion. Now the polyatomic ion here that we are talking about is the chromate ion. And the chromate ion has a formula of CrO4 minus two. Now the rule of thumb for chromates or for any, any ion that ends in ATE is that basically we keep, we're gonna keep the root of the word, the chrome in this case, and we're gonna change the ending from eight ion to ic acid. So we change this ending for this one. And so this becomes chromic acid. If the ending were ITE ion, then the only change would be that instead of ic acid, we were changing the ending to OUS acid, us acid. So if I had the chromite ion, it would become chromus acid. If I had the nitrite ion, it would become nitrous acid, as opposed to nitric acid. And so that's really all that there is to acid nomenclature. Um, if it is binary, if it is uh, you know, one uh, it, uh, acid with hydrogen and one other element, then you use the hydronaming system, which is really similar um, 
it is actually very similar to this uh, first system, only the word hydro gets put in front of it. Uh, so hydrochromic acid, which does not exi exist, uh, but hydrochromic acid would be just hydrogen and chromium. Um, again, that doesn't exist because chromium doesn't take on negative charge. Um, but if it did, that, that's what it would look like. And so we see that with things like sulfur, nitrogen, um, um, uh, phosphorus, um, uh, where we, we uh, have uh, uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Um, those are probably the most common ones um, where that, that kind of character uh, takes on. With, with nitrogen and phosphorus, those substances, um, ammonia and phosgene, uh, those actually take on more basic kinds of properties, which uh, is another subject for another day. Any questions about nomenclature? No. All right, so what we're gonna get into now then is we're gonna start looking at chemical bonding. And there are three primary types of chemical bonds. There are the ionic bonds. These are bonds that uh, are the result of transfers of electrons between atoms. And the end result is that we get this electrostatic attraction because the thing that lost electrons is now positively charged, and the thing that gained electrons is now negatively charged, and the two are attracted naturally to each other. Um, and those uh, attractions are electrostatic. Um, so a very, very strong uh, and can get very, very close to each other. And so ionic compounds tend to have pretty rigid kinds of structures to them. Um, the second type of covalent, or second type of chemical bond is the covalent bond. The covalent bond comes from, when we look at those outermost electrons, those valence electrons, elements instead of transferring one electron to another, will end up sharing electrons with each other and making these linkages that, um, are not nearly as strong as ionic co compounds, but kind of based in the same idea. The, the electrons in this atom get close enough to this atom that the nucleus can start to pull them in. And the electrons in this atom are close enough to this one that the, the electrostatic attraction, they, they do get some attraction to each other. Now they don't get nearly as close to each other the bonds are not nearly as strong because they're not based on pure positive and negative charge, but rather proximity uh, attraction where uh, the two get close enough to each other that they can feel each other's electrons. The third kind of bond is the metallic bond. Now the metallic bond is, is kind of unique and this is what gives a lot of those metallic properties that we associate with metals. Things like luster, uh, conductivity, um, and, and, and the like. And how those work is basically the metal ion, the, the metal atoms themselves will donate their valence electrons to a collective pool of valence electrons that is commonly referred to as the sea of electrons. Now, that sea of electrons means that every single atom in the proximity of the sea of electrons feels and has access to the electrons in that grouping. And so this gives a lot of unique properties. So why is metal so flexible, so bendable? Why is it hard to break apart? Um, well, um, the primary reason it can take such abuse is because since those electrons are all being collectively held by all of the different atoms in their proximity, it becomes a lot harder to dissociate them from each other. Even if you pound on it with a hammer, the metal atoms themselves are still going to have access to that sea of electrons and because of that they're going to stay attracted to each other. 
because we also have free flowing electrons in that sea of electrons, that's where those properties of conductivity and the ability to uh, reflect light uh, come into play for metallic substances as well. And so from that kind of standpoint, we can see why different kinds of properties exist for the different compounds. So in the case of covalent compounds, in the case of covalent compounds, we can see that the molecules here tend to be further apart from each other. Um, and we don't see a whole lot of attraction usually between covalent uh, substances and each other, uh, which is why covalent compounds usually tend to have lower melting points, lower boiling points, and we tend to see them in a variety of different phases. Ionic compounds form these very organized and, and uh, structured substances. Um, and for those reasons, they tend to uh, have very high melting points. We tend to see them really just only in the solid phase. Occasionally we see uh, liquid uh, crystals. We, we see them most often in things like uh, liquid crystal displays on calculators, televisions, those kinds of things. But uh, it, it's a rarity to get a uh, crystalline liquid um, that is just naturally at room temperature um, in the liquid phase. Um, metals, it's even more rare. We can only think of one really, and that's mercury. Um, and you can see from the arrangement here, look how close together those atoms are to each other. Um, and because of that, we get a lot of that collective packing, that closeness uh, that gives the, the substances their, uh, their, their uh, due. So let's talk a little bit about ionic bonding. So ionic bonding is based upon this idea, uh, a principle here where we have to create ions, which means something has to lose electrons and something has to gain electrons. Now, in the case of sodium chloride, we know from our ionization energy, that again, the ionization energy is the energy it takes to remove an electron. We know from that ionization energy that to remove one electron from one mole of sodium, it would require 496 kilojoules of energy. We know this, we've measured this. But the question is, how much of that energy do we get back when we actually form the ion uh, uh, and give that electron to the chlorine? Well, we know from electron affinity that chlorine is going to get back 349 kilojoules. It's going to release 349 kilojoules of energy when it goes out and gets that electron. But if I look at the energetics here, hold on a second we are giving up far more energy to make this ion than we are getting back in making this ion. And if we actually look at the video itself, for the formation Uh, what what is that? What did he do? All 
All right, so so what 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 was happening there is we were taking a piece of sodium, putting it into an atmosphere of just chlorine. Oh, uh, okay, that's what was in the ladle. So the sodium was in the sodium metal was in the ladle. The the cylinder had chlorine gas in it, and as soon as the reaction started. You saw basically the ignition of that sodium and all of this fire looking stuff until the sodium all gets used up and you get all this white sodium chloride powder left over. So there's something missing here. The actual electron transfer seems to require energy. After all, it took more energy to remove the electron than what we got back when the chlorine took the electron. So the question I have for you, I'm gonna uh, uh, mute my microphone and let you guys talk for a couple of minutes. Why is this the case? Why does sodium chloride release so much energy when it forms, but yet it requires energy to actually do the electron transfer? So go ahead and talk to each other. I'm going to mute the microphone here and just let you kind of reason your way through here a couple minutes. Um, from that observation, I'm just going to say that it takes energy to do work. So it took a certain amount of energy to basically start it. And then uh, once it started doing the bond, it released the excess energy in the form of heat. I agree also. It sounds like everybody's in agreement there. Um, and and we're, we're, we're pretty close. Um, the thing that we're forgetting, uh, so uh, Brett was saying something to the effect of, well, it requires a little bit of energy to get started and then once it, once it gets going, uh, the energy release comes there. And you're right in a sense on that. The thing that we're forgetting, the, the part of the equation that we didn't talk about is the actual attraction and the associated energy of the ions actually attracting each other and forming a crystal. This is something called lattice energy. And so lattice energy is the energy associated with, I've got two ions, one positive and one negative. Now separated, they don't have a whole lot of attraction for each other. But once they attract each other and form a crystal, that attraction is energetically more stable than what they were apart from each other. And anytime we gain stability in any form or fashion, that stability and that excess energy is going to get released. Now we can quantify that energy using something called Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law tells us that the energy associated with um, the attraction of charged particles to each other is related to a constant multiplied by the charge so uh, the charge of the first ion multiplied by the charge of the second ion divided by the, the distance r that those two ions are apart from each other. 
And what I want you to notice is that the charge here in fact does matter. If this one is negative and this one is positive, negative times a positive would give a negative value for E. And as we talked about late last week, negative values of energy indicate that energy is being released. If I had both positive or both negative, I would have positive E, which would mean that I would need to have energy inputted to force those, th those th things to stay together. Um, so if I've got two electrons occupying the same space, there's going to have to be some amount of energy that is inputted to keep them together um, in that confined space. Their natural inclination is going to be to want to be apart from each other. Okay, so the sodium had a positive and the, uh, the, the chloride had a positive. So that's... The chloride had a negative. Remember, oh, the, okay. the so electrons the, going from the sodium to the chlorine. Released the energy, so why did he add the energy then? Well, if, so what we're talking about there, that's, that's activation energy. That's energy to start the reaction. So we needed to get the the metal hot yeah so that it would be susceptible to losing those electrons and giving them to the chlorine okay once it did so once it did so um the coulomb's law takes over and the amount of energy associated with um coulomb's law is far greater okay than the energy input initially because the molecules are uh, faster is that why basically at a molecular level well so the they're in a more stable state as ions than they were individually as atoms um and and we can get into uh we will get into the energetics of that um later today um uh we we kind of alluded to it already with electron configurations um you know sodium has just the one electron in its in its uh, outermost energy level if it loses that electron it goes to a noble gas configuration chlorine has seven electrons in its outermost energy level um, two in the S and five in the P. If it adds one more electron, it now has six electrons in that P sublevel, which would give it the same configuration as a noble gas. And so there is an inclination. Uh, we haven't talked about this yet specifically. It's called the octet rule. There's an inclination among the elements to try to gain noble gas configurations whenever they can. Um, because it is theorized that the reason why the noble gases are so unreactive is because their electron configurations are so stable that they have no need for reaction. Okay, let me get this right. Okay, so you said a negative and a positive. Are they re okay? Can you just hear me out on this one? So if you got a negative and a positive, they're going to react. If you got two positives, you're saying that it needs energy to to keep them in that same space. So there's yes. two different. Okay, so negative and positive, they're reacting. Fine. Okay. Negative and positive are going to be naturally attracted to each other and would release yes. energy when they came into contact with each other. Yes. Okay. I'm trying to make sure I got it right. I wasn't on my phone, so I was I had to type because I didn't log in from my phone. But you can hear me now. But okay, I was trying to make sure I get it. Okay. So, so yes. Uh, now, there is different quantifications as far as last energy is concerned. Um, so some ions are going to do it better than others. And so what I really want you to think about is that there, there's, there's two parts to this. There's two ways that we can examine um, and look at this. 
we can think about it from the standpoint of charges. So if I have higher charges, a uh, positive two versus a positive one, a negative two versus a negative one, those are gonna naturally be more attractive than, than their counterparts. That's the first thing to think about. Yeah. So obviously the, the bigger the charge is, the, the more attraction we're gonna find. The other thing that we're gonna to wanna to look at is um, size. If I have bigger ions, that's gonna mean less attraction. Uh, Cause again, what you have to think about is that the, the interactions are between the, the atoms themselves. And so if, if the atoms, if the atoms are large, they're actually gonna be less attractive because there's gonna be uh, less packing, less space for those other ions to become attracted to it. So if I'm looking at a chloride ion versus a fluoride ion, because the fluoride ion is smaller, it's going to have a larger uh, level of attraction. Think about it as a compactness. If I have a negative one charge spread out over a large space, then collectively the negative charge is going to be felt less over the bigger space than if it was in a smaller space. So that periodic trend of ionic size is important here as well. Um, where the bigger the ions are, the less attracted to the, each other they are. Any other questions here? No. And so we can see this manifest. This is a table of lattice energies. And so the two phenomena that we were talking about, charge and size, can be shown here pretty well. So I'm just going to put a check mark here next to all of the compounds that are positive one and negative one, which would be this entire first column. Now, if I compare that, so let's, let's look at something of a similar size. So sodium and magnesium are of a similar, are in the same energy level, um, same sublevel. But if I compare sodium chloride to magnesium chloride, look at the massive jump in lattice energy. Lattice energy more than doubles. In fact, it, it, uh, more, it more than triples. Why is that? Well, we've got two things going for it. First of all, magnesium is a positive two ion. So, it is double the charge of the sodium. The second thing is that the magnesium is also smaller than the sodium ion um, because it's got more protons in its nucleus and so it's able to attract its remaining electrons even more and that makes the whole atom, the whole ion a little bit more compact than what the sodium ion was. And if I do similar kinds of comparisons, I can see similar kinds of results. But even more locally, if I look at lithium, this class of lithium compounds here, fluorine, chlorine, iodine, the lithium compound, the charges, they're all the same. The only thing that's changing from this one to this one to this one is the ion. And we see a downward trend in lattice energy 
as we go down the group. And again, the reason there is size. The fluorine is the smallest, so its charge is the most compact. The iodine is the biggest, its charge is the most diffuse. And as a result, we get less energy, less attraction for the diffuse charge compared to the compact charge. But the thing that you wanna look at also here is that the effects of size are not nearly as pronounced as the effects of charge. We saw here that similar size compounds got more than double energy by changing charge. Whereas, what did we change? We changed by about a third based on size. Um, and that's going from, you know, the tiny four, the tiny two energy level fluoride compared to the large five energy level iodide. So, these changes are a lot more nuanced, a lot less pronounced. Changes in charge are a lot more significant. And we can even see that, look at the difference between magnesium chloride and magnesium oxide. Look at the difference between magnesium oxide and scandium nitride, where we had positive two and negative two here, and now we have positive three and negative three here in the scandium nitride. So charge is much more important, much more pronounced, much more significant than size is. But if all things are considered even other than size, then we would look at that as a way of evaluating the strength of the ionic bond and the, the closeness, the, the attraction of the ions to each other. Any questions about lattice energy? No. No. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about covalent bonds then, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a short break for um, just kind of uh, uh, stretch our brains out a little bit. Uh, covalent bonds, these are ones that are caused by when atoms uh, share electrons, uh, in particular when they share pairs of electrons. And we can quantify their strength based upon two factors. Uh, and we'll talk about these factors more tomorrow. Um, bond length, uh, which is intimately tied to the uh, level of attraction, just like we saw in ionic compounds. And then bond energy, which is that quantification of the energy itself. How much energy does it take to break uh, a mole of those, those bonds? And what we'll find, and we'll talk again, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, is that there is an inverse relationship between these two, which again, in the realm of what we just said about Coulomb's law make, should make some sense. The closer they are together, the harder it is to break them apart. The further they are from each other, the easier it is to break them apart. And that's basically what this is going to tell us as well. When our bond length is large, our bond energy will be small. It'll be, the bonds will be easier to break. With regard to metallic bonds, Again, metallic bonds are what we see that uh, sea of electrons. And uh, that sea of electrons is also responsible for something called electron mobility. Uh, electron mobility meaning that ability for ions to move freely uh, through a substance um, or uh, charged particles, electrons to go th freely through a substance. And, that explains conductivity for metals. Metals are very, very good conductors of electricity because that sea of electrons creates for them a freestanding zone of, of electrons that uh, they're able to move around. Um, 
metallic bonds uh, do form these kinds of lattices. It's not quite the same kind of lattice as an ionic crystal. Um, but what we get are uh, called close packing structures um, where those atoms in that matrix are touching many other atoms in a similar fashion, uh, which is why metals are considerably more dense than, than other substances. Um, now, if you have to take Chem 2, uh, you will see in Chem 2 we will talk about uh, these kinds of arrangements, how uh, metal ions are, and uh, metals are packed onto each other, you know, what kinds of three-dimensional orientations and relationships are made, but that's, that's beyond our, our scope here. Uh, so if you have to take Chem 106, uh, you'll see it with us there. If you have to take Chem 2 at your university, uh, you'll see it there as well. Um, but uh, that's another conversation for another day. What we're going to start looking at after the break are we're going to start looking at the idea of Lewis structures. Um, now Lewis structures, Lewis dots and Lewis structures are ways of showing two-dimensionally what kinds of bonding are possible for a chemical compound, a chemical molecule. Now we started with a post-lecture assignment that forced us to do things like these, where we would look at an electron configuration, we would look at the position of, a, of an element on the periodic table, and we would assign a number of valence electrons to it based upon its position in the periodic table. And so sodium being in group one, would have just one electron dot. Chlorine being in group 17 would have seven electron dots. And again, the goal is eight uh, because noble gases have eight valence electrons and they are stable. So the way to do that is to either vacate your energy level. So if I get rid of this electron from sodium, which would give it a, a positive one charge, it would now have a noble gas configuration, the noble gas configuration of neon. And if I give that to chlorine, the chloride ion, Cl minus one, now has a full valence set as well. And so what we have developed here is if we look at the individual co configurations, sodium was neon um, 3s1 and chlorine was neon 3s2, 3p5. By taking that electron away, sodium now has the configuration of just neon. Chlorine now has the configuration of argon. Both have taken on noble gas configurations, or at least, um, you know, uh, in this case, they both have. Um, in the case of transition metals, it's usually close enough um, in their cases that they can um, that they can go forward but now that we have we have configurations inside of the atoms that are much more stable because they now are on noble gas terms and in the process of gaining that stability we've created charged ions and those charged ions are going to attract each other um, that is the basis of our ionic compound. That's the basis of our ionic bond. And so from a structure standpoint, all that we would need to show is that the sodium has lost its electron and now has a positive one charge. 
and the chloride has now one extra electron, and that extra electron has given it a negative one charge. Now, we're gonna take a, a few minute break here. Um, and when we come back from that break, we'll come back at a quarter after 10, so 10.15. Uh, when we come back from that break, we're gonna talk about covalent compounds and um, how those are kind of set up, uh, how we can draw them and, and represent them in two dimensional space um, and show their molecular structures as well. So that's what we're we'll doing coming back. So 10 minutes, come back at 10.15, uh, I'll see you then. All right, so what we want to get into in this uh, second half of the lecture is we want to start to look at the Lewis structures for, for covalent compounds. And there's a process to this. The process to this is rather straightforward and, and simple. We need to start by identifying the number of valence electrons. And so if you have not done the Lewis dots activity yet, um, this is where that activity is really gonna come in handy. Um, the, the simple fact of the matter is the place, the column in which the compound, or excuse me, the, the element exists, tells us the number of valence electrons we should expect for that element. And so when we're looking at a structure, all we need to do is modify that, apply that, um, add together all of the different atoms and their valence electrons, and that'll tell us how many valence electrons are gonna be in the entire molecule. The second thing that we wanna do is we're going to determine a center atom. The center atom is going to be the one that is the least electronegative. So ordinarily speaking, we're looking for for things like carbon, nitrogen, um, in some cases things like phosphorus or sulfur. Um, basically, the further away from fluorine it is, the, the more likely it is to be the center atom. From that center atom, we're going to draw a simple structure. The simple structure is where we draw everything with a single bond, and we just take it from there. So we draw single bonds to everybody. We make sure that everybody gets an octet. So we add lone pairs to all of the atoms in the structure until we get to that lone uh, octet for everybody. And then we do a comparison. And that's what step four here is, the comparison. We compare the number of electrons in our simple structure to the number of electrons that we we're supposed to have way back here. So in step four, we compare our structure back to how many we were supposed to have in step one. And the general rule of thumb that we use is that every two electrons over equals removing one bond. Or, I'm sorry, um, that's, that's actually, that's backwards. For every two electrons over, we add an extra bond. So what we look at is, let's say that we have 26 electrons in the structure and we're only supposed to have 24. That means that we're going to have to add another bond and get rid of some of the lone pairs. Um, and for every two electrons that we are over in that kind of way, that's what we need to do. Now, if it's the other way, let's say that we had 26 electrons, but we were supposed to have 28. Well, if there's any extras to be added, we're gonna put them on the center atom. Um, and because of the, the relatively low electronegativity of the center atom, 
there's a chance that it, it's, it's um, in need of extra electrons in those kinds of cases. So the only way to really go after this and to really do it well is to just do a lot of examples. And so with the remaining 45 minutes or however long we have left here, my intention is to do lots of examples and show off a lot of the different things that you can do and that you should do to make sure that you are drawing the structures and drawing them correctly. So let's start with kind of a simple example, but one to just kind of get our feet going. The Lewis structure of ammonia, NH3. Now, if I take ammonia, ammonia has five valence electrons for the nitrogen, because it's in group 15, plus one valence electron for each hydrogen, because it's in group one, multiplied by three, because there are three of them, I get eight electrons in total for my uh, ammonia, eight in total. Now, determining the center atom in this one is pretty easy. It's going to be the nitrogen. Hydrogen can never be a center atom because hydrogen, um, because it is so small, it can only hold two electrons and every bond contains two electrons. So hydrogen at most can make one bond. And it makes hydrogen a really unlikely and really lousy choice for a center atom. Now, one other thing I can tell you, conventionally speaking, that element that we put first is usually a tip off that that's gonna be our center atom. Doesn't always work out that way, but it's one of those more often than nots. So, I'm going to draw in my structure now. I need a nitrogen. I need my three hydrogens. I'm just going to kind of arrange them around the nitrogen like this. I need my single bonds. So I'm going to draw in my single bonds here. Now, hydrogen. is satisfied with two electrons. Um, so I need no more dots around any of the hydrogens. The bonds give the hydrogen the two dot, the two electrons um, that they need. Mr. Brooke? Yes? I thought that nitrogen was seven. Nitrogen has seven electrons total, but only has five valence electrons. Okay. So um, what we need to think about, okay, we talked about this a little bit on Friday. Let's, let's review. This is the electron configuration of net of nitrogen. Oh, 2P3. Uh, let's fix that real quick. So that's the electron configuration. Now, when it comes to bonding, we never concern ourselves with core electrons. And so this is one of the reasons why we do those noble gas configurations to kind of help us with that. So if I look at the noble gas configuration, of nitrogen, this is what I get. And so I can see there are only five electrons in that outermost energy level that are capable of bonding. That's where oh. this five comes from. Okay. Okay. And since hydrogen is just one S one, it only has one valence electron anyway. And so there are three of those. So that's where the three comes from here. Comes from the three in the formula. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. You're welcome. 
Okay, so we've got our hydrogens, we've got our bonds. We haven't filled the octet of nitrogen yet, but we need two electrons because we've got two, four, six around the nitrogen. Two more will give us the eight that we're looking for. And so now we've got nitrogen, we've got everybody with an octet. How many electrons are in the structure in total? Well, every bond is two, so two, four, six, plus these two electrons here, that's eight. So my, my total structure had eight valence electrons in it, and that matches the eight electrons that I had from the very beginning. Since that is the case, I've got a valid structure here. I've done a good job. All right? Any questions so far? No. All right, let's No. Let's take a look at a, a little bit more complicated of an example. Now we're looking at acetylene. Acetylene is C2H2. Now, if we do the same kind of math, each carbon has four valence electrons, and each hydrogen has one valence electron. So, total number of electrons here is 10. Eight for the carbons, two for the hydrogens. Eight plus two is 10. Now this is, a, this is a unique case, because in this case we actually have two center atoms. Uh, both of the carbons are acting as center atoms. And so when you see organic molecules like this, this is often the case, where we have multiple center atoms at the same time. And so the way to approach it is, we kind of treat them like their own separate kind of cluster. So I've got a carbon bonded to a carbon, and then each one of them kind of divides the rest of the material in the compound evenly. So one of the hydrogens goes to this carbon, one of the hydrogens goes to this carbon. Now, if I fill in my dots for the carbons to get them to eight electrons, I would need four dots on each carbon because I had two electrons. I had four electrons from, from the bonds, two from this one, two from that one, which means that this carbon would need four more to get to eight. And the same deal for this carbon. This carbon had two here and two here, so that's a total of four. It needed four more to get to eight. Now, if I add this all up together, I had two electrons here, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen electrons in this particular structure. I go back and I compare fourteen electrons in this structure compared to ten in this uh, calculation. Obviously, the molecule that I've drawn is incorrect. Yeah. I can't have more electrons in a structure than what I have to work with. So we have to go back to our rule of thumb then. Our rule of thumb says every two electrons that were over means that we need to have one more bond. Well, I'm four electrons over, so that means that I need two more bonds. But where can I put those bonds? I can't put them between the carbon and hydrogens because hydrogen can only hold one bond's worth of electrons anyway. So it has to go between the carbons. 
So I'm gonna erase all of my dots here. So if I have to replace two extra bonds and they can only go between the carbons, then that's where they're going to go. And so my single bond between carbons has now turned into a triple bond. And if I do that, I now have two, four, six, eight electrons around this carbon, so I have no need for dots anymore. I have two, four, six, eight electrons around this carbon, so I have no need for dots on this one either. If I count up the total in the structure, two, four, six, eight, ten. I now have 10 electrons in the structure, which matches the 10 electrons I'm supposed to have. And so I now have a valid structure for acetylene. Okay, with that, is it equal? Okay, H to C is one instead of two because each bar is two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. Are you two, four, six, eight, nine, 10? C to H is one. And H just gives one instead of two, counting the bar is two. No, the bar is still two. So I've got two, four, six, eight, ten. Oh, okay. Never mind. Okay. I'll get it now. Okay. Yeah. Each line is worth two electrons. Now, if I, have a, if I have dots in the structure, each dot is worth one, but each line is worth two. So I have 10 electrons because I had two here, I had two here, and I have six now between the carbons. All right, any questions? Okay, so ordinarily, if this was a face-to-face, -face, I would be having you break into groups and we would be working on a, an, an activity in your lecture packet. Now, if you have the lecture packet or if you have it handy, I would encourage you to get it out. Um, and what we're going to do primarily is we are going to look at um, this activity in the lecture packet. Now, uh, the Lewis model of electronic structure, which I, I believe, I believe I said is um, uh, starting on page one one thirteen of of the packet. Um, But what we're going to do is, since none of us are actually sitting next to each other, um, what we're going to do instead is we're going to kind of we're going to go through parts of this together, and as we come to interesting molecules, we're going to go back to the PowerPoint here and and talk a little bit about some of the things in the molecules that we're looking at that are interesting. So again, if you have this, I'd encourage you to, to kind of look your way through it. Um, if you're kind of getting stuck in some of the, the, the details here, uh, this is one of those structured activities where um, there are some guiding questions that can help you uh, piece together some of the information but we're actually gonna go straight to the exercises here. And what I want you to do is bearing in mind, keeping in mind what we have done thus far, um, I want you to try to do these first two here on your own. So take, let's say five minutes 
and try to draw these two structures um, without my assistance. And um, at the end of the five minutes, we'll see how you did and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of address questions. If you get done faster, uh, just give me a verbal affirmation that you're done or just uh, drop a done in the chat um, and, and we'll come back a little bit quicker than that. But let's take five minutes and, and try to draw the first two structures here. Okay. All right, let's see, let's see how everybody did. Okay, so the first one should have been very similar to what you saw in the ammonia example. You had oxygen in the middle. You should have had single bonds to hydrogen on each side. And then to fill out the octet of the oxygen, you would have had four electrons. Two sets of dots. <clears throat> uh, and so that would have been what you would have seen for the water. Any questions on that one? Uh, yeah, just real quick. Uh, I'm just kind of going back to what you said last week, uh, that oxygen bonds with itself. So why is there not two oxygens? Yeah, because that's what I had. Yeah. Okay. So yes, oxygen bonds to itself and it does here. Yeah. That compound there is when oxygen bonds to itself. Okay. Okay. Now, if we look at the bonding structure for oxygen bonding to itself, what we see is that oxygen has a tendency to form two covalent bonds. In the case of oxygen here, it made two covalent bonds with another oxygen. In the case of water, instead of making two covalent bonds with another oxygen, it made two covalent bonds with two hydrogen atoms. It's all about filling that octet. So oxygen will form, generally speaking, two covalent bonds to fill its octet. Now, if nothing else is around, it'll do it with itself. Oxygen will bond with other oxygens to get its two covalent bonds to fill its octet to stabilize. But if other atoms are present, that's not going to stop oxygen from going and bonding with those other atoms. We, we see that all the time. Um, oxidation is that class of reactions where oxygen is going and reacting with something else. Um, you know, oxygen is reacting with um, iron to make rust. Uh, oxygen is, act, is reacting with um, copper and making a patina. Uh, that bluish green kind of uh, stuff that covers the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. Um, oxygen is capable of doing that. Um, however, if nothing else is around, oxygen will naturally pair up with other oxygens, like we see in this second example. Okay, uh, just to go in a little deeper here, if oxygen has a negative two charge, why would it want to bond with another negative two charge of itself? You're confusing ionic and covalent bonding. Okay. Oxygen, if it forms an ion, would form a negative two ion, again, Oxygen has six valence electrons. Mm -hmm. Adding those two extras would get it to eight, which would stabilize it. Yeah, okay. But that's just one way to stabilize it. It could stabilize itself through ionization, or it can stabilize itself covalently through uh, sharing, sharing electrons. Okay, so they're, so they're both kind of sharing to balance each other out then? at that point. So in covalent bonding, what happens is that these four electrons in this case mm -hmm. are evenly distributed between the two oxygen atoms. Okay. So this oxygen on the left counts it, these four as part of its own. 
this oxygen on the right counts these four electrons as part of its own. Okay. And so the e in this case the evenness of that sharing means that you know neither oxygen has advantage over the other. Neither oxygen really carries that charge or excuse me, carries those electrons more than the others. Now we'll talk tomorrow about uh, polarity. And when we have things that are polar, that polarity is going to dictate when um, electrons are shared unevenly between atoms and what the driving force behind that is. And that's something called electronegativity. Okay. And uh, I've been curious about this for an hour. Can, how, how's my audio coming through? Do, can you hear a lot of background noise? I can hear what well, sounds like the leaf blower, but I can hear you just fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm outside at my parents' house. And yeah, there's this guy <laughs> that's been doing lawn work for about two hours. Oh, that's fine. Uh, and I just wanted to know... Because uh, it's super loud to me. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't so loud to you guys that you couldn't hear me. No, we can hear you fine. Okay. Okay, so let's... So those are kind of the more simple examples. Let's look at some more complicated examples and illustrate when we can apply certain kinds of principles to make the complicated things a little bit less complicated. So let's look at PF5. Now in PF5, we have phosphorus, which has five valence electrons, and we have fluorine, which has seven valence electrons, but there are five of those. So total amount of valence electron is 40 electrons in PF5. And so if we start and we start trying to build this, the first thing that's gonna jump out to us is Look, I've got phosphorus here in the middle. And if I start connecting all of these fluorines, uh, okay, I got three there. And there's a fourth one. Hold on a second. Where do I put that fifth fluorine? At the top. Well, but if I do that, I would That's have to the break key. the octet rule, right? Or phosphorus already has four bonds. That's eight electrons. Yeah, but P, you have to satisfy. You have to satisfy. I know it goes at the top. Oh. You're right. It does go at the top. <laughs> Let's talk about why it goes at the top. Uh, okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shove it over to the PowerPoint again here. Um. So if I look in the PowerPoint here, let's go to the spot where we talk about um, advanced valence, uh, expanded valence shells here. Now, we can go and break the octet rule in certain cases. The certain cases that we're talking about are for elements that have atomic numbers greater than 12. Now, why greater than 12 specifically? Well, what we're talking about really here is a requirement we need a third energy level. Um, now, we don't see expanded octets for magnesium and for sodium, which are technically in this energy level. Um, because they tend to form ionic compounds and not covalent ones. Um, if they did form covalent compounds, they would technically be allowed to do this as well, but that's just not something that they're going to do. But what's special about the third energy level? What does the third energy level have that the first and second energy levels don't? And what happens 
in the third energy level is now we can expand upon the valence level. The valence subshells are the S and the P subshells. And so with the two electrons in the S and the six electrons in the P, that gives us our eight electrons that make up the valence shell. But in the third energy level, the D sublevel also is available. Now we know that the D sublevel is higher in energy, but it is still technically there in the third energy level. And so if circumstances dictate, it is possible to put extra electrons in that D sublevel starting in the third energy level. And so any element in the third energy level, the third row of the periodic table or below, is technically able to do this and is technically able to break the octet by going beyond eight valence electrons. But in order to do so, they have to meet a couple of criteria. One of them is that you have to be able to get a valent Lewis structure out of it. And the second is that formal charge has to be minimized by doing this. Now, what is formal charge, you may ask? Well, formal charge is one of the ways that we establish and break ties between structures. So if you flip up to a couple of pages prior, um, there is an example in there regarding the compound N2O. And if you draw N2O, what you'll find is that there are three different ways of drawing the structure. You could have it with a triple bond between the nitrogens. You could have it with a triple bond between nitrogen and oxygen. Or you could have it evenly balanced here with nitrogen um, and oxygen, each having double bonds. Now, which one of these do we choose? Well, formal charge helps us to make that kind of approximation. We can calculate the formal charge, and formal charge is the individual charge on an element in a compound. Generally speaking, formal charges should be minimized zero as much as possible. So if I look at these three structures and all of them meet the initial eye test, they all tell us, hey look, these are all structures, they all have the correct number of electrons. They seem to be kind of equivalent. What gives? Well, the way to calculate formal charge is I take the number of valence electrons for the given element, I subtract from it the number of electrons in lone pairs, AKA what I call familiar, familiarly the dots. And I also subtract from it the bonds. So formal charge is valence electrons minus dots minus bonds. And it, again, it's evaluated for each individual element in a compound. So for the nitrogen here, I can see that nitrogen should have five valence electrons. This particular nitrogen has two dots and three bonds. So if we follow um, my line of, of argumentation here, five minus two minus three 
gives us a zero formal charge on this nitrogen. This nitrogen in the middle, five valence electrons, no dots, four bonds, five minus zero, minus four, gives a positive one charge on that nitrogen. And for this one, this oxygen, six valence electrons, six dots, one bond, six minus six minus one gives you a negative one charge on that oxygen. And so I can see this is carried out all the way across for all three structures here. And I can see that when I do this process, one of the structures immediately stands out as being different from the others. And it's this structure here on the right. This structure here on the right, very, very different from the others. Has formal charges on all of the atoms, has a negative two charge here. And for that reason, we actually would say this is the worst structure of the group. So this one is not the correct structure. If I had to choose between these two structures, I would end up saying that this structure here is the more favorable one compared to this one. And the primary reason is because where that negative one lies, having the negative one on the oxygen versus the nitrogen the oxygen, since it is more electronegative, is more likely to carry that charge stably than the nitrogen is. But when it comes to looking at coming back to this idea of breaking the octet rule, it is okay to break the octet rule if it helps with formal charge. And so if we come back to our original example, where we had the PF5, I've got that phosphorus in the middle. If I put the fluorines all around it, does having five bonds hurt the formal charge on the fluorine? Well, to answer that question, we're going to have to uh, draw in the dots on all the fluorine. So just take a second here. So counting up everybody real quick in the structure, remember we started with 40. We now have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36, 38, 40. So the structure itself has 40 and that matches our 40 there, so we're good on that end. From a formal charge standpoint, on the fluorines, all the fluorines are the same. They all have one bond and six dots. So seven valence electrons minus six dots minus one bond is a formal charge of zero. And the formal charge on the phosphorus, this is where our uh, theory gets tested the most. Five valence electrons, no dots, 
five bonds, that's also a formal charge of zero. So breaking the octet rule here actually zeroes out all of the formal charges. And so for that reason, we can say that, that, it, that it is allowed to break the octet rule. So again, the the two rules for breaking the octet rule. One, you have to be an element in the third energy level or greater, um, meaning you have available D sublevel. And secondly, the formal charge has to be minimized by breaking the octet rule. Um, and usually that means that we end up having zeros in places. All right, any questions there? I don't believe so. All right. All right, is it okay with everybody if we do one more example? Uh, I know yeah. I'm at 11 o'clock right now. I, I don't wanna waste your time, but if, um, if it's okay, I, I'd like to do the nitric acid example before we broke. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Okay, so for nitric acid, Using our same set of uh, circumstances here, I've got one for the hydrogen, five for the nitrogens, six for each oxygen, and there are three of them. So total number of electrons here is 24. Now, one point of order here with regard to acid drawing. Obviously, hydrogen is not going to be our center atom. Um, the nitrogen, in fact, will be. But when we're dealing with acids, what you want to know about acids is that acids, the hydrogen, actually bonds to oxygen, not to the center atom. And so what we have here is one of those circumstances like we saw with acetylene, where we've got two center atoms, essentially. We've got nitrogen bonded to oxygen, and we also have the oxygen bonded to hydrogen. Now, the other two oxygens are also going to be bonded to the nitrogen. So here's our kind of base skeletal structure for nitric acid. And so, if I start with this and I start to fill in the octets, I've got four electrons around this oxygen, so I need four more. I've got six electrons around this nitrogen, so I need two more. I've got two electrons around this oxygen, so I need six more. And the same thing for this oxygen, two here, so I need six more to make eight. Now if I count up everything in this structure, I have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26. I've got 26 electrons in this structure as it is written currently. So what does that mean? I got two too many, so I'm gonna to need to redraw this with one extra bond. The question is, where does that extra bond go? In between N and O, I got this confused because I drew it wrong. Okay, all right, so Chazzy, you're right. It's gonna go between N and O. Which N, or well, obviously, which O 
is going to get the second bond. The one between nitrogen and hydrogen. This one? Yeah. Okay. So let's just say for the sake of argument no. that, that well, we do that. I'm, see, that's confusing. Because then you're messing with nitrogen. Well, no, that makes no, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Well, let's let's do it. Let's do a quick little experiment. If I'm looking at this oxygen and its formal charge. I've got six valence electrons minus four dots minus two bonds. Six minus four minus two is zero. So right now, this oxygen has a formal charge of zero. If I add an extra bond to this, it's no longer going to have a formal charge of zero. It's gonna have a formal charge of something else. So this oxygen we're gonna leave alone. If I look at either of these two oxygens over here, six valence electrons minus one bond, uh, uh, excuse me, minus six dots, minus one bond. Both of these have negative one charges. So at changing the bonding structure around them is probably going to help in some kind of way. Not going to worry about the formal charge on the nitrogen right now because I know that I have to add a bond and nitrogen is going to be involved in some way. So trying to make nitrogen's formal charge better doesn't, doesn't compute. It's not going to matter because it's going to have to change anyway. Okay. Well, how I originally drew it, I think it was used because, okay, how I originally drew it was H dash N. You got a dash above N, a dash below N, and two dashes between N and O. I just couldn't satisfy nitrogen. That's where I got stuck. Okay. But I guess it was wrong anyway, because you said hydrogen can't be um, right. in, connected in, to nitrogen. In acids, and this is true for all acids that have oxygen in them, any oxygenated acid is going to have the hydrogen attached to the oxygen. That's, that's going to be its structure. Um, always and and um, without fail. So the question is, do I put the double bond here or do I put the double bond here? Do I put it to the left or do I put it up? Wouldn't it give you the same outcome? It would, it would. What we're talking about here is a, a phenomenon known as resonance. Um, and so for, to that end, I'm going to kick it back to the PowerPoint one more time and talk about resonance. So resonance occurs when we have the assignment of a multiple bond, like a double bond, and its assignment is completely arbitrary. So take ozone, for example, here. Ozone has a double bond, single bond structure. And this structure on the left is equivalent to this structure on the right. If I was drawing this just from scratch, like we have been for the past hour or so here, I would come to the same kind of decision that I, we've been debating for a couple of minutes here. Do I put the double bond on the left oxygen? Or I put it the double bond on the right oxygen. And the, the, the fact of the matter here is that it really does not matter because in reality, neither of these two structures is fully correct. And we can prove that spectroscopically because if I examine the bonding, a double bond should be shorter than a single bond because a double bond is stronger and it's going to pull, pull those atoms closer together, which is going to increase the amount of energy it takes to get that bond to break. But we don't see that in the structure. We don't see a shorter bond here and a longer bond here. 
we don't see the vice versa of that either. What we see are two equivalent bonds, two bonds equal in length. And so what that means is that in reality, neither of these structures is correct or complete on its own. The only true nature, the way that we can show it is by showing both of them together at the same time. And the way that we do that from a two-dimensional drawing standpoint is we bracket them and we draw arrows, double-headed arrows between them to show that the two structures are equivalent to each other. And another place where we see this, this is especially in our organic chemistry, is with benzene. Benzene has this um, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond arrangement in this uh, six-membered ring. And the actual drawing of benzene is equally valid with the double bonds starting in the up-down position here or in the cross diagonal here. And so much so that when we draw benzene, we often don't draw it as this single bond, double bond structure. We draw it with this circle in the middle of it. And the circle means that the um, electrons that are uh, being shared here are ultimately evenly distributed amongst these six carbon atoms in the ring. And so one thing that we look at in resonance is something called bond order. Now, bond order in general is just the number of bonds between two atoms in a molecule. So in some of our other structures, we would say, okay, the bond order uh, for the carbon-hydrogen bond was one. The bond order for um, uh, the PF5, each PF bond had a bond order of one because they were all single bonds. The bond order in oxygen, O2, is two because it has a double bond. When we deal with resonance structures, bond order is equal to the number of bonds being shared divided by the number of atoms sharing them. So in the case of benzene here, I have one, three, four, six, um, seven, nine. Nine bonds divided by six carbons in the ring is equal to one and a half bonds per carbon. So the bond order here would be one and a half. And if we looked at it from the standpoint of energetics, the, the bond energy that we find in benzene is slightly more energetic than a carbon to carbon single bond, but not nearly as energetic as a carbon to carbon double bond. Now, let's take that back to the example we were looking at. So redrawing this in here, we had a nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen set up for the acid. We had single bond to oxygen, single bond to oxygen. What resonance is telling us is that our structure here is actually incomplete. What we really need to do is 
we can draw it this way with the double bond on the right and fill in the octet for the, the oxygens that way. But this isn't actually the complete picture. Complete picture involves, I've got to have a nitrogen to oxygen double bond up here as well. And these two structures together represent the complete picture of what it means to be nitric acid. And so the truth of the matter is that this structure on top and this structure on the bottom are not technically correct, um, either of them by themselves. The reality lies somewhere in the middle where I've got my acid group here, I've got my oxygens here, and then I've got some sharing of electrons that is existing uh, where this bond and this bond are somewhere around one and a half bonds. Because again, if we do the bond order thing, I have three bonds divided by two oxygens. So my bond order there is one and a half. And so this phenomenon of resonance is, is a really interesting one. Um, and we see it often in these kinds of cases where there is a perceived arbitrary nature of sorts to the um, compounds um, themselves in terms of their bonding. Um, so that's where I want to stop for today. We'll do some more structure drawing and some more things um, along those lines tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll also talk about bond energy and polarity and um, um, electronegativity and that kind of stuff as well. Um, but, you know, this crash course that we're kind of giving here, where we're going to be going through this pretty quick, um, it's really imperative that you spend some time getting yourself used to how to draw these things. Um, if you're in the lab, uh, it's not on today's assignment, but it's on tomorrow's assignment. There is a Lewis Structures Skill Builder. Um, where you'll get an opportunity to draw lots of these molecules and get a good amount of practice with them. Um, and obviously you've got the post-lecture activity as well um, and the chapter four homework where you're gonna get practice along these lines uh, in, in those kinds of ways also. So uh, before uh, we uh, take a, a break here uh, uh, for um, lunch and uh, before my office hours. Any questions that I can get from you here uh, regarding, um, regarding what we talked about today? The selenium, you don't have to draw it, don't. I, I just wanna say, is it 16 electrons for the? Uh, so, so selenium, would be six valence electrons plus the 14 for um, the two fluorines. It should be 20 electrons in total. So it's not 16. No. Okay. Well, okay. That's all. Yeah. Selenium, selenium is in the same group as oxygen. So it's six valence electrons and each fluorine would have seven. So the way to really look at it um, is 
if you're looking at that noble gas configuration, um, it's still it's not all of the electrons in the noble gas because if the if there are d electrons in there, those d electrons are in the lower energy level. Okay. You're really only looking at the s and the p of that higher energy level. Those are the ones that are going to interact. So that's why it's just six and not sixteen for selenium. Okay. Because those D electrons, those ones that are in the 4D orbital, 4D, right? Yeah, it has to be. Yes, that's what I went off of. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, those electrons in that in those orbitals, um, they're in the lower energy level, so they're not going to interact. Okay. It's it's only in the so. At this point, we're only concerned with those those higher energy level electrons, those valence electrons. Okay. Okay. All right, other questions? Not at the moment. Okay. That was a very apprehensive take, but I'll, I'll uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So um, office hour today at one o'clock um, uh, in Collaborate. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'll see you there. Otherwise, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, you too. Me too.